Hey, thanks for being a part of the conversation. Let's do some pod crashing. Episode number 244 is with Rowan Jacobson from the podcast Obsessions White Chocolate. I'm good. How about you? Absolutely fantastic. I mean, come on, dude. With a name like Rowan Jacobson, I mean, that's like Indiana Jones. You are living <laughs> up to that name. <laughs> that's funny. Like, yeah, you know, when you're a little kid, you don't like you having a weird name, but the, then you grow into it eventually. <laughs> and grow into it, you have. I mean, look at what you have done throughout your entire career. <laughs> Thanks. You know, Rowan, I've always said that if chocolate were discovered today, it would be called illegal. And because it does things to people in a good way as well as a very bad way. And that's what's great about obsessions with wild, you know, wild chocolate is the fact that you're exposing something to the rest of the world that, wow, we did not know. Yeah, I mean, chocolate is a drug for sure. It's just like it's kind of a it's a gentle, happy drug, you know. You, you call it the God-level chocolate, which you guys went in search of. I mean, it's, it's like, okay, did you get to taste it? Because all the podcast episodes are not up there yet, dude. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it started. It was when I first taste, got a taste of it, when that first bar of wild chocolate came out uh, like 12 years ago. I was like, holy cow, what is this stuff? And then uh, that sort of began the journey to go find it. What what led to the podcast in the way that, I mean, I, I understand that you're a journalist and you like to the investigative reporting and doing the stories and stuff like that, but but there was something that you had to have heard in your heart that said, yep, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, so I had, like I, like I said, I had tasted a, that bar of wild chocolate uh, years ago and it, it thought it was incredible. Um, and had always kept that in the back of my mind. Uh, and then I had just recently learned that other people have gotten excited about it and have actually found more varieties of wild chocolate, wild cacao growing in the Amazon. So now there is this kind of like Indiana Jones style uh, hunt on, on underway to go into the jungle and find these varieties of cacao and make really unusual chocolate out of them so i was like that sounds fun i want to be part of that does does the average person understand where chocolate comes from because i i, I think it just comes from the grocery store it grows there right yeah right no um <laughs> nobody nobody even realizes chocolate it's made from the seeds of this tree that grows in the rainforest called cacao so it's got the cacao tree has these pods on it that look almost like little nerf footballs you know or or delicata squash or something and so you open up the pod and there's these seeds inside and you have to ferment and dry the seeds and then roast them like you would coffee and then grind them and that's what chocolate is so yeah chocolate is the seeds of this tree and nobody realizes that do you ever sit there and wonder who was the first to open up that little pod and and to do exactly what you just explained somebody had to have started that journey yeah and somebody some genius thousands of years ago yeah so um, they keep find archaeologists keep finding older and older evidence, but right now the oldest they have is from about five thousand years ago in Ecuador, I think, where they found these pots that have chocolate residues in them. So they know that at least five thousand years ago, the people in Ecuador were drinking chocolate. Wow. Um, but the thing, like, so those pods, uh, those fruit pods, like, the, they've got the seeds inside, but they've got this uh, pulp around them that's delicious. It's kind of sweet. It tastes almost like like lemon or lychee or mango or something. So probably what happened is people were just eating the pulp for a long time and spitting out the seeds. Yep. Uh, which they still do in the Amazon. Um, and then, you know, maybe like around the campfire one night, you know, somebody threw the seeds in the fire and the fire burned out. And the next morning they're like, huh, those things are kind of toasted now. I wonder if they're edible, you know, and somebody tasted one and was like, this isn't so bad. And, oh my God! And then it all began. You this, know? this reminds me so much of I have gumball trees here in the south, and 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 they used yeah. to they used to travel from from uh, you know Asia to come and get the gumball because that's what they chewed on. But nowadays, if you if you walk through anybody's yard, they're gonna say gumball tree. That's a junk tree, but it's not. <laughs> when you open up those little thorny things, my God, there's gum in there, dude. Wow. And do you have to do anything to it or, or can you just eat it straight up? Well, yeah, I, I, I do I, because I, I, you know, I, I came from the day of just eating everything natural. I'll, I'll eat a potato fresh from the dirt. So I don't know if you're supposed to do anything <laughs> or not, but I, I do. And, you know, it's, it's like I've got wild grapes out here. I don't do anything with them, but I just eat them. Yeah, I eat wild grapes, too. Yeah. And, they're and, and they're bitter as all can be. But you know what? It doesn't matter. You're, you know, the, the earth has given it to you. And I, I just, and I think that's one of the reasons why I'm so attracted to your podcast is that you throughout your whole entire career has have always been about the earth and what it shares with us. Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm I love to forage for stuff. Um, and I'm just amazed that, yeah, that you can just like eat all the stuff in nature and 
it's kind of like a very direct way of learning about nature and experiencing it. With with your podcast, Obsessions, Wild Chocolate, is there a side of you that fears the amateurs are going to try to make their way to the Amazon? And, you know, we're going to screw it all up when we do that. <laughs> I do worry about that with other things. In this case, it's a pain in the butt to yeah. make your way to the Amazon. So, <laughs> I, like, you got to really want to do it, you know. Um, <laughs> like, even the pros that I was tagging along with, like it's hard you know you need boats you need equipment you got to work out deals with the people who live there because somebody's going to be picking all the pods and and drying the beans um even you know if everything goes right it's really hard I just I just have this vision when when you talk about picking the pods and the seeds inside and stuff because in in Montana where I grew up we used to grow sunflowers to, to for the seeds and I, I remember yeah. that you know you had to dry them out and then you had to bake them and and yet when I see sunflowers today people don't understand let that damn thing grow man there's seeds coming your way right and then you said you see the birds just like, like oh yeah going to town on sunflower seeds <laughs> and you're like oh yeah that's what it's for <laughs> what one of the things that's really cool about your podcast is the fact that you 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 really go into crashing into a a major cocaine flyway i mean i just the, to me it's like oh my god he knew he was on some sort of adventure and he wasn't gonna let go yeah it started it started so badly and i was so <laughs> ignorant like i didn't do my research I, if, if i'd done like a little homework i, um, I would have realized that the area we were going into was like the cocaine trafficking center of the universe but i didn't so yeah within like my first five minutes in the amazon we had to do sort of an emergency landing in the small plane uh, because it was the rainy season all the runways were half underwater so we picked this runway this like little landing strip that had just been cleared in the jungle and we landed and it turned out the that it belonged to these these drug smugglers who had a cocaine lab there, and they weren't very happy that we just used their, <laughs> their runway. And that, like in Bolivia, in that part of Bolivia, that's just like how stuff happens. It's a it's a crazy place. Did you whip out your uh, your your journal and just start documenting it? Because I mean, this is the kind of stuff that you know stories about fifty years from now are going to be jumping onto. They're going, oh my god, you're not going to believe it. It was all for chocolate too. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, "Hey guys, can if you just hold on with those guns? I think I get out my <laughs> notepad." And, no, but you know, actually, so for the podcast, of course, like you know, I'm, I'm there with my field recorder, um, so I'm trying to get audio of everything, and you'll hear that like in the show, you'll hear tons and tons of uh, field audio in the moment all the time. But I was constantly, you know, the anxiety was like, I know I'm just going to lose all my equipment over the side of the boat at any moment, you know, or like the rains are going to sweep it away, like. There was uh, working with like electronics in the Amazon is mm-hmm. uh, never never comfortable. <laughs> how did you recharge your batteries, or how, how, did you even have to bring extra batteries and stuff? Because I mean that stuff really drains you know the juice from that system. Yeah, you know I I brought a, just a bunch of uh, extra batteries, um, but I I was using this uh, this field recorder. It's a, called an H two N Zoom. That's me. That's me. That's exactly me. Yep. 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 I've got one. It's it's an amazing. It's an old device. It's been around for what twenty plus years. Yep. But um, it it is amazing in in that it uses very little bar- battery power. It's tough, um, and it it gets pretty good sound quality considering like sort of how old school it is. Yeah. So I I actually found that uh, um, to be a, just an awesome device to use for that kind of situation. Did you turn off the top two microphones on top? Because what I do is I turn those off and I use the bottom plugs to get, because I, I just, I just want to have total control of the left, right channels. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, so like so often, like I had so little control uh, out of the, in the environment that I didn't want to, I didn't want to get any, to more fidgety than I had to. So I just had it on sort of like the XY, like the cross yep, yep. microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, yeah. I'll tell you, and that explains why I feel like that I'm listening to NPR when I, when I hear your podcast, because the quality is there because I can hear the atmosphere behind you. And that's part of the st- a star of this story, dude. When, when I can hear the background, you took me somewhere. Yeah. And you know, and, and that's all just there. When I was, um when I was listening back to it, as the episodes have been coming out, that was one of the things that struck me is like, wow, there's always some crazy bird going in the background. <laughs> and that's not that's not sound design. Those, those are just the birds that are there, you know? <laughs> See, that, and you can't find that in a production library. You can't say, go get that bird sound and put it in the background. No, that, I mean, that, that's the authenticity of what you're doing. 
Yeah, and in fact, now I should go. I should actually just start selling some of those sounds because I <laughs> some some of the craziest ones didn't even make it into the show. They're just like in the uh, in the library there. So now in in post production, when you've got all of this sound, how do you pu- how do you put each episode together? Because when you start at number one and ma- and work your way up, there there is an unbelievable storyline going on there. How how do you know as as the person that lived it? Now you have to share it. Yeah, and honestly, that that was by far the most painful part of the experience. Like, you know, it was two months getting the material and then six months yep. dealing with the material. And as you know, that's just how it goes. Wow. Do, um, you, do you break it down and put it in files in, in the computer? I mean, I mean, what what do you do? I mean, because, I mean, you, you have long tracks and talking uh, moments and stuff like that. I mean, how, how do you know where to grow? Yeah. So so base, so, um, you know, you upload all all the files are there and you go through it and then you start to build, like figure out what are your little set pieces? Like what are the, the best pieces of audio that you want to work with? Yep. Um, Cause you know, the voiceovers you can always do, you can do anytime. Um, so you sort of build it, but this was, it was sort of a challenge. I'd never tried to tell um, like one contiguous story, eight half hour episodes <laughs> in audio before. Right. And like, I know how to do it in print, but it, it's very different doing it in audio. So you had I had to just sort of keep experimenting with like what worked, what did, didn't, how chronological do you have to be? Like how like will the listener be able to stick with you if you're hopping around in time? All all that kind of stuff. And I had some great producers who could do the heavy lifting on on the actual. Uh, sound integration part of it. Well, the fact that you keep it at around 30 minutes is great because I believe that it doesn't matter what sa- what city you live in, London, Seattle, or even Charlotte, every town is a 20-minute town. You're only 20 minutes away from where you really want to go. <laughs> so 30 minutes is the perfect time for us to really dive into your podcast. That's such a good line. Every town is a 20-minute town. That's so true. Yeah. That's, um. you're right. That's, uh, and, and just, just the ear can only concentrate for that long, you know? Absolutely. Now, the personal question I need to ask you, and, I, and listeners are going to have to jump onto a Zoom with you sometime. Why are we seeing your back and not your face? What's going on? Are you a spy? <laughs> um, uh, so that's uh, that. That, that uh, my wife took that photo. I'm actually staring at a Mark Rothko painting. Oh wow. Um, um, but and you know, and like Mark Rothko, it's those like totally abstract, just huge blocks of color. And and what uh, he always said to people is like, you have to get super close to the painting and just be there for a while and it'll start to change. <laughs> so I'm standing like six inches away from that thing um, and uh, waiting for the painting to come to life, which it did do. All of a sudden the colors start to kind of crawl. It's really weird. Um, it, uh, it takes like a while, like four or five minutes. But anyway, my wife, like, like the way it was all lining up. So without my knowledge, she, she snapped that photo behind me. Well, isn't that what podcasting is too? Because I mean, you, you know, you first go into a podcast, you know, like the first episode and you're going, okay, I'm getting into this, but, but you stay there long enough. And by the time you get up to the third, the third episode, you're going, Oh my God, I'm really starting to see this now. Yeah. And that was the hope here is, is that, um, because it is a long story and it kind of keeps getting deeper and more complex as you go. So the hope was that people uh, will will hang there um, into episodes, you know, two and three when it really starts to grab hold. Mm-hmm. It's like a novel, you know, like, but I think, um, you know, right now in podcasting, there's also, also a fear that everybody only has a three minute attention span. And if you don't get them in the first three minutes, they're gone. So mm-hmm. you got to balance all those things. So we, you know, we tried to throw lots of like plane crashes and drug runners into the first three minutes to, <laughs> to try, try to keep people from going elsewhere. Is there a side of your personality because you've been to the Amazon and, and you've experienced it with with the wild chocolate and stuff that you would like to sit down with, with Volker uh, Lehman and say, okay, dude, I think you're addicted to this. Okay. You 20 years into this search, dude. I mean, come on now, come on. You're, you're really addicted to this journey. Hey, yeah, yes, for sure. Like as soon as things start to to stabilize and it starts to become a normal business, he then immediately like does something so that he has to go back in and like <laughs> go on, on another crazy journey where everything is at, at risk. Um, what and is, I get he, that what is he looking for? Well, even you, if you if you go back, what are you looking for? What can top that great flavor? Yeah, and you know, it's like like and and what are what has everyone always been looking for in the Amazon? You know, you go all the way back to the days of the conquistadors. Um, Percy Fawcett, the explorer who, you know, disappeared looking for the last city of Z. Like everyone goes, it's, it's that Indiana Jones thing where like, there's sort of this promise that you, you're going into this super intense environment and there's going to be some sort of revelation <laughs> upriver, you know, that you're going to get to. Um, 
and you do like i'm sorry what i what i found was that like you don't get the gold like everyone always goes there looking for gold right. and if it's if you if it's too uh, if you're thinking the gold is just going to like jump out in front of you you're probably going to be mistaken but what you find is like that you do have this like new uh new take on experience because you've had this incredibly sensory um experience going on for days or weeks or whatever and uh that's the real gold you know is that journey does it screw with the mind do you have those visions late at night you're sitting there listening to the to the sounds of the amazon you're going tomorrow's the day man i'm feeling it tomorrow's the day (laughs) yeah well and then but then there's also so many friggin bugs yeah. <laughs> all around that also screws with the mind so you definitely you get into a defensive crouch at the same time where you're like i'm just gonna survive one more day <laughs> <laughs> listeners you need to understand that stetler chocolate is a huge part of this in the way that they donate part of their profits to to protect the amazon forest i didn't know that until your podcast yeah so this is an arrangement that they made with luisa abram who's the chocolate maker in brazil who's uh, one of the main characters in the story and Louise's whole business is to um, work with the, the native groups that are in the Amazon to they harvest the chocolate and um, she like her proceeds go back into the jungle to support their lifestyles. Um, and Stetler has now teamed up with Louisa where they're bringing this chocolate to the US um, and selling this package. So uh, yeah, it's um, that's part of the beauty of the whole thing is that it's this not only do you get to experience these unique and delicious chocolates but you get to support um a living rainforest and the people who live there at the same time do you find yourself being a chocolate connoisseur i think so yeah really Um, like not not i'm not snobby about it but (laughs) once you taste really well-made chocolate you start to realize how poorly made the cheap stuff is, yeah. and and you can't really go back to it very easily. Dude, I I I can tell that just by by jumping into a Snickers bar. It's like as a kid, it was like the greatest thing on the planet. But you're right, there are so many great pieces of chocolate out there now that when you go, when you go to a Snickers bar, nothing against the bar. It's just there is a difference. There is. Um, one of the things I did at, at one point, you know, I'd been eating this really really good chocolate, and I started. I always start to you know like be suspicious of my own like like. Am I just getting fooled here? So yeah. I went back and bought one bought a Hershey's, the first Hershey's bar I bought, you know, like outside of making s'mores in years, um, just a straight up Hershey's bar. And I, I was just like, all right, what's this going to taste like? Um, mm-hmm. And I have to say, it was really strange. It tasted a lot stranger than I expected. Oh my God, um, you've turned into Gordon Ramsay. Like, right, I know. It's like, <laughs> I, I hate to sound snobby. <laughs> But that's weird. That's that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> to bring this story forward, I mean, it's, it's, you're, you're opening up the eyes. It's almost like it, there, there's a book screaming at you to say, write me, write me. Because, I mean, there's a lot of wine uh, encyclopedias out there. Is it time for a chocolate encyclopedia designed by you? I think there does need to be a chocolate encyclopedia. Um, there are people who know more about it than I do. So I'm um, actually a couple of people that I interview in the show, like the, these chocolate experts they do have this encyclopedic knowledge of this stuff, like where it all grows, like how, you, what are the best ways of making it? They, and they know it all. Um, and I've actually been encouraging them to sort of, you know, put it down on the page. Uh, and they also have great photos. So there, there's a great book to be made. You're right. Yeah, yeah. When, when you're out there in the Amazon, when do you know it's time to turn on the microphone? Cause you can't let it play all the dang time. Yeah. And um, I'm sure you've had this experience too. It's, that that's another anxiety provoking yep. like deal is like how do you n- how do you not miss the good parts um and one answer is to record way too much yep. um but it never you then, then in, inevitably like three hours later that the moment you decide to turn off your uh your recorder then the good thing's gonna happen the monkey you know? jumps so, in yeah <laughs> every every time it's amazing um <laughs> so yeah you uh you get better and i wasn't very good at this at first i'm still working on it, i think but you get better at sort of um anticipating starting to sense that something's going to happen um and you know you don't you like the good podcasts you know like they're they get the the greetings right like Mm -hmm. They're, they, everyone's figured out that you you start recording before you like walk up and introduce yourself to whoever, because it it sounds good to get those early early um, remarks. Um, it it sort of 
helps put people in the moment in a way. Oh yeah, because you you learn the fine art of learning how to set people up. You you know where you want to yeah, go. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. is is your mantra because I love this. I love this a part of your podcast, and I picked up on this. And man, I've written a lot about it. Trying to do something great in a world that bites back. My God, that's incredible. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what I really admire in in people. Like, it's not for like if you do it all right. Yeah, there's you know there's some financial like you'll be able to make a living maybe. But so many people that uh, I've written about and uh, you know or or recorded, they're not in it for the money. They're they're just doing this thing because they want to create something like authentic and yep. interesting and and good. You know, um, and I think that's what drives. Um, so many of the most interesting people out there. Wow, dude, I'm so proud of you for doing this. I mean, and I can't wait till you create other podcasts and grow things forward because you, you just have this amazing way of sharing stories. Well, thanks. I really appreciate that. You got to come back to the show anytime in the future, dude. The door is always going to be open for you. Thank you. I'd love to. Yeah, great conversation. All right, man, you be brilliant and go have some chocolate, okay? okay. You too. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. All right, take care.